Today, new topic. So let's talk about inheritance. So there are two parts about inheritance I would like to talk about. The first part you should be very familiar with about how you can use, for example, super, like in Java. Like uh, they got the correspondence called precursor. So there are two aspects to the uh, inheritance. The first one is about reusing the code. So you can allow, uh, you can uh, eliminate as much as possible code duplicates. So that's a good design principle. And the second one is a little bit deeper into the uh, OO, which is called polymorphism and dynamic binding. I'm pretty sure you get exposed to these two ideas back in 2030, but I would like to maybe try to go a little bit deeper to see why we have such design principle, polymorphism and dynamic binding. Of course, you see some simple example to show you. And inheritance, again, is not just specific to iPhone. It's, uh, whatever you learn from this lecture here, also it can be uh, applied to Java. Okay. So let's see, let's just go over the first part. So the first part is about how we can do code reusing using inheritance. And to do that, let's think about a simple problem here. I'll present to you, first of all, a solution that does not use inheritance. And let's see how bad it is. And then we are introducing inheritance. After that, we'll go to the second aspect to see how you can think about polymorphism, dynamic binding, okay? The second part, of course, is more interesting. But let's get through the first part. Okay, I'll read it together with you. So that's going to be the uh, running problem that we're going to, going to do throughout the lecture. Okay, so we are dealing with a student management system. So we store data about students. And there are two kinds of university students. We got either resident students, students who live on campus, and also non-resident students who actually live outside. So both kinds of students, they have a name, they have a list of registered courses. So these are the two attributes, basically. And for both kind of students, both of them, they are register, they can register for a course at no more than 30, let's say. And we, when we calculate the tuition, we have to do some discrimination. Because somehow for students who actually live outside the campus, uh, in that case, we can um, somehow, do, we, don't have, we can charge them a little bit less, so we have some discount rate over there. And for, st for students who actually live on campus, we're going to charge them a little bit more for, to cover their accommodation. Okay, that's kind of the intuition. Okay, we got two kinds of student here, resident or non-resident. For resident students, we got premium rates, and we got non-resident where we got discount rate. Okay, we got these two kinds. Okay, is it clear just about just roughly what the problem is, right? So we're gonna build on top of this. Even for this, uh, it gets a little bit more complicated when we talk about polymorphism and dynamic binding. But sim simplicity is good. So now here is the challenge for this sign, okay? Of course, you know how to do that in Java, but let's think about a little bit more from the design point of view. We want to design classes which will somehow simulate this uh, scenario over here. We got students, we got discount rate, we got premium, we got so many different things. We got something that the two kinds of students share in common. We also got things that they don't share. Okay? So let's see how we can do it. I'll just give you about 10 seconds, just think about how you might do that in Java. Okay, that's okay, for in iPhone. And then I'm gonna present to you the first solution, which, is, which doesn't use any inheritance, okay? And that one's actually quite straightforward because somehow directly corresponds to what we have over here in the problem, okay? Okay, let's do it. So now, first of all, in both versions, we have a class called course. And for the course class, it's very easy. So we have a class called course, and we have a constructor called make. And there are only two attributes for the course, title and fee. And the constructor is going to initialize the course using the title and the fee. Right? Okay, the course class is very easy. So now let's talk about the first solution. Okay? And then I'll show you uh, the code is also available, so you can also play with it. So let's say we have a class called resident students. Okay? Resident students. And what does resident student have? They have name, courses, and premium rates, right? They don't have discount rate. Discount rate does not apply to resident students. And let's say resident student also has a make feature. And so we got name, string, courses. Let's use linked list since uh, you haven't really used that so far. I think it's really good to get used to. And also we got premium rates. There's a reason that I highlight some parts of this code here in yellow. You will see why, okay? We got premium rates and also we got a constructor which will initialize the resident student with their name and also create an empty uh, courses, right? If you say link list.make, it's gonna give you an empty list. So far, so good. 
And we also get something called set PR, set premium rates, okay? Because we know that premium rate is specific to resident students. So we have also another feature command that's specific to your resident students, set premium rates. And then we have register. Remember, both kinds of students must be able to register. So you can register for a particular course for these students. You can use extends. Extend in linked list is like add to the last, insert last. And we also have a query over here. Remember the uniform access principle. For the tuition over here, we can choose either to implement the tuition as an attribute or as a query. Let's say in this case, a query, okay? And for this tuition query over here, we have some local variable called base, the base amount. And we say base amount is initially zero. And then if you study the uh, iterator pattern that we talk about, so as a client of the iterator, so you can see linked list over here, it's an iterable class from the library. So you can simply say across the courses over here, because the courses is iterable, right? Across the courses, and then C is a cursor uh, over the items in the list. And then you can say base amount is simply incremented by C.item.fee, right? The course, individual courses, okay? So far, not too tricky. And then once you get the uh, base rate, you just multiply by the premium rates for this particular resident students. Any questions until now, just for the resident students? Somehow the code is very simple, just fit into one page. So that's intentional. So just keep things simple. Okay? If no questions, I have a question for you. Let's say in the next slides, I'm going to def de uh, define a class called non-resident student, the other kind. How similar will they be and how different will they be? That's my question. Yes. Oh, that's good. I'm, I'm glad you noticed that. How? Different class, not resident student, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Set uh, premium rates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, very good. I'm very happy that you observed that. Okay, let me just repeat very quickly. So everything that's highlighted in yellow is gonna be, is gonna highlight the differences between the two classes. Non-resident students, discount rate, and set discount rate, and then multiply discount rate. That's the only difference. So let's see the class over there, and then we'll, we'll, we'll be ready to discuss how bad this design is. There's no inheritance. You can see everything else, everything other than yellow will be duplicated. Let's see the next slides, non-resident students, the same constructor, and we got the same attribute repeated twice, names and uh, courses, name and courses. Discount rate, that's different, and we got um, uh, the constructor here, the same, so you can see the constructor is exactly the same as before, exactly the same, okay? And then we have the uh, set discount rate and register tuition, etc. For the tuition here, that's, that one's interesting. You can see it's almost the, almost the same. It's just that at the final stage, for the non-resident student, you're gonna apply discount rate. In the other case, uh, premium rate, okay? So now, you can see that a lots of duplication over here, okay? Remember I said in the very first class, not just about iPhone, in any other language, whenever you see lots of duplicate in your uh, design, that means your design smells. So our current design smells. But what's really so bad about it, okay? So let's go get there. Okay, we'll be re almost ready for discussion. But before we talk about how we can improve the design, we have to first convince ourselves at least this de design is correct. It does what we intend to do. And then we'll think about how to refactor that, how to improve it internally. Okay, that's kind of the, the job. How do, you, how do you make sure it's correct? You can write the test cases. Let's just run the test case uh, on the slide very quickly. So you can declare C1, C2, their courses, and then Jim, resident student, Jeremy, non-resident student, just get some intuition how you can use them. Let's say we got 2030, we got 3311. Let's say for now, 500 bucks for each, okay? Either too cheap or too expensive, right? Just say 500. And then we say for Jim, because Jim is a resident student, let's say we set a premium rate to be 1.25. That means whatever base amount we calculate, we're gonna multiply by 1.25. 
And then Jim is going to register for both courses. And now, you shouldn't be surprised. The tuition is going to be 1,250, right? 500 plus 500, and then multiply 1.25. Okay, that one, that one pass. You can, again, you can see the source code. It's made available to you. The second one, Jeremy over here, Jeremy is a non-resident student. In this case, the only difference is, so Jeremy also registered for the two courses, but now the discount rate is 0 0.75. So that will give you 750. So even though they're registered in the two courses, but the way we calculate for the tuition is different. One for discount rate, the, the other one for uh, premium rate. Any questions about this test case? So from this test case, we can more or less be ensured that our design, even though it's bad, is at least correct. If it's not correct, we don't even talk about it. Okay? So now let's think about why this design is actually bad. Okay? So the two classes seem to work, but can you see any potential problem with that? Let me give you a hint. I would like to think in this kind of direction. Every, as I said before, every time you're doing a software project, it's most likely to be ongoing, which means you, you never draw a closure on that. You have to maintain your software. So which means it has to be subject to bug fixes or subject to functionality extension. So either way. So now, let's say this. In terms of adding a new function or fix, let's say, let's say this. Remember we got a register feature there, right? To register a course. If now I want to change the way I register for a course, right? Let me give you a little bit concrete hints over here. Over here, you can see the way I do this register course over here is unconditional. I always add the, the course into the, uh, um, into the, the, cor uh, the courses link list. Let's say now I change the policy for both kinds of students. I'd say every time if you're trying to add a new course, a better check if you already uh, reach your maximum capacity, let's say 30, for example. If you have, do something there. If you haven't, you can go ahead and register. If I change the policy over here, okay, how many classes do I have to change? Two, right? Both the resident students and non-resident students, okay? Now, hypothetically speaking, what if I got 10 kinds of students? Here, I only got two kinds. Let's say I got 10 kinds of students, depending on maybe their nationality, their immigration status, or whatever way, criteria we, we use to categorize students. Let's say we got 10 kinds of students. Initially, everyone got the same way to register the course, like I just extend to the end. But now, suddenly, we change the policy. How many classes do we have to change? 10, right? So that means every time you introduce a change, you have to make that change in multiple places. Okay? This violates something called a single choice principle. Okay? That's something you have to uh, ensure. Okay? I'll just show you over there. Okay? So first of all, we've got lots of duplicates over there. That's one thing. So we're repeating the same register method for two times already. And also the, the same declaration for name and courses for two times already. Right? Lots of duplication. What's even worse? What's even worse? Whenever you want to change a policy, you have to change in multiple places. I'll show you that in iPhone Studio. It's worth demonstrating. Okay? So now, this is something that we'll keep talking about. It's called single choice principle. Of course, this is just one example. Whenever you find that in your design, if you want to change a particular requirement or functionality, it causes you to change in multiple places in a similar manner. That's a violation of the single choice principle. So this is just one example. I'll try to mention more examples as we go. But a single choice principle is definitely one of the learning outcomes for this course. Okay? Of course, this does not just apply to iPhone, to any other language you have. OK, so now I want to demonstrate this to you. I'll just show you in the slide very quickly. I'll show you in the iPhone Studio, too. Let's say for the registered course, of course, you can make this as, as a precondition. But for now, let's say if then else. So we used to say only courses that extend. That's, all, that's the only thing we say. Now we say that for both kinds of students, we want to say if their current uh, capacity has been reached has reached the maximum, that means we've got to do something to signal the error. Otherwise, we can go ahead. So now let's see what this means in Ivo Studio. So, so for today's source code, got, I got two projects for you. One is called a bad design. The other one is called a good design. Let's now focus on the bad design. If you go to the bad design there, you will see that for resident students over here, let's see that. 
So over here, you see you have register over here, right? If you look at the other one, which is non-resident students, that one there has exactly the same duplicates for the register. If I want to imp imp uh, impose a uniform policy, I gotta change more than one places. For example, this is what I should do. This is most likely what you would do as a programmer. You would say, if I can say courses dot count, which will give me the size of the courses so far. If that's already larger than equal to 30, let's say the maximum, then I can say some error. I'll leave that to you. Otherwise, I can just do this over here. Okay, that's only the change of policy in only one class, which is resident students. But now I have the two classes out of sync, right? So what I should do, maybe, I will just have to copy this and go to the resident students class and then paste that. But again, every time you have to do something manually rather than automatically, it's really prone to errors, okay? So this is not very good. Um, is it clear up to now? Okay. Okay, so again, since every, uh, every change that we want to do uh, has to change in both student classes, in that case, it's a violation, single choice principle. Okay, I can let you try the uh, second one uh, uh, out of the class. So let's say we want to change the way we calculate tuition. Let's say we want to introduce something called inflation rate. In that case, you gotta change the, uh, the way you calculate in both classes. Okay, the same idea. Okay, let's now think about another scenario. If I want to have a student management system, in which case I'm going to collect both kinds of students, the uh, resident students and non-resident students. At the moment, they are separate classes, right? The resident student and non-resident students. Let me just show you some, something on the notes. Oh, I forgot to turn it on. Let me do that now. Okay, movie. So now let's now have a look at how the two classes are related at the moment. Let's say without the inheritance, this is what we have. So without the inheritance. So we simply got resident students and also we have non-resident students. They have nothing to do with each other. Okay. So that means if I want to somehow have a class called student management system to collect all, uh, both of them, I cannot simply have just an array and then that's going to contain both resident student and non-resident students. I cannot. Of course, in Java, you can say an array of objects, but that's not a very good design principle. Okay? Because over here, array and linked list in IFO, they're generic, which means you have to pass uh, the uniform type over there. Okay? So now let's see what you, you might do, but, uh, but we can see how bad it is. What you can do is something like this. Let's say we got student management system here. What you can do is you can maintain two lists over here. One for resident students and the other one for non-resident students. Okay? But what's the drawback for this? So that means every time if you want to do any common updates to both students, you have to ac uh, go across the list twice. Right? I'll show you one example. Okay, okay let's say uh, you have, let's say here, if I want to add the students into the management system, if I want to do that, I have to write two separate features over here. So one is called resident students for add RS, and add non-resident students, it's two separate ones. Okay, so, so uh, again, the way I do the uh, updates inside the, du uh, the implementation here will be very similar. Again, I have du code duplicates, okay? And if I want to have a method, let's say, register all. Let's say I want to register some common course for all the students. In this case, a single loop wouldn't actually do it. I have to somehow uh, have two separate loops. The first loop, I'm gonna go across the registered students. And the second one, I'm gonna go across the non-resident students, okay? Now, I have one question for you, okay? You might be thinking that this can be a solution. In Java, I know that you can have something called object array, right? That's what you have, which means you can put anything into it. 
In Java, you, uh, in iPhone, you do something like this. You can say array of any. Remember what we said before, object in Java is simply any in iPhone. I'll just briefly talk about how even more problematic this design might be, okay? If you say the following, so if you say class students management system over here and n, and then I will simply say students. And over here, I will simply say it's an array. And let's say linked list. They are the same idea. Linked list and then of any. So now let's think about whenever you have some storage like this, you got to think about two ways. You got to think about the way that you store something into list. And then you think about the way you retrieve something out of the list. This, what this gives to you is the flexibility of taking something into the list. Anything can go in. But when you take something out, you're going to have trouble. Okay? I'll show you why. Over here, let's say, let's, let's say just that. Now for illustration, I'm going to put some client code over here. So now you can say students dot extent. And now over here, since we said any, so over here, any object will do. For example, if I say, I'll put it here. If I have resident students, and then I would say student one is something like that. And also I got non-resident students as two is something like, something like that. I can both put S1 and S2 in, no problem. That seems to solve our problem, but not really. I can also have, let's say, account, ACC. And then I can also put ACC in as well. So somehow you allow some object that's not of type students into the array. So that's actually even worse, okay? So when you retrieve anything outside the array, you have no guarantee that they are students anymore. They can be account, they can be any garbage that's irrelevant. Okay, so now my point is you should really know why simply having an, uh, an array or linked list of any is actually even the worst design. Okay, we want something that's better. We want to say we only want to put students into the uh, array, but the, the student can either be resident or non-resident students. Okay, that's what we want to achieve. Uh, but without inheritance, you cannot do it. Okay, now, any questions up to now? Okay, okay so we have residents, uh, so what we will do, so we have this, uh, so the keyword you're using in iPhone is called, just called inherits rather than extents, okay? So what we want to do is, resident students is a special kind of students, non-resident students is a special kind of students, okay? That's what we want to do, that's what we achieve. And somehow, we factor out all the common code that exists between resident students and non-resident students into this common superclass or parent class and leave anything that's specific to the classes at that level. Okay. Let's see the code very quickly. Okay? You will see that it's very similar to how you define in Java because iPhone is also object-oriented, so you shouldn't find it strange. Okay, let's say we got, so now we talk about the second solution where we got inheritance. So let's say we have a, a class called students over here and then it has a make feature. Okay, constructor. So now we declare everything that's common, everything that was not highlighted yellow, basically, over here. Okay, so we have name, we have courses, and then we have this make feature, which we initialize with name and also courses, empty courses. And then we got register, and we got tuition. Over here, you can see that I only calculate the base amount only, only in the common part. Depending on whether the current class is resident students or non-resident student, we apply different rates, as we'll see. Okay, so in the inheritance solution, we introduce a extra class that's going to store all the common information between the two kinds of students, okay? Let's see how things will work out. Now, so let's say we have the class resident students over here, and all you gotta say is inherits or extends in Java. Now in IFO, you have to say, if you ever want to override a particular uh, feature, you have to declare over here. You may have noticed that already in assignment, in lab number two, where I said inherits any redefine is equal, right? You gotta explicitly redefine that. You gotta say, now I want to redefine the tuition query over here. 
Okay? So now I still got a make, and make is completely reused from the uh, superclass. So now the only thing that's going to be different is premium rates. So this is specific to resident students. And then we have set premium rate that's also specific to resident students. Now, for tuition, what should we do? We should somehow use part of the uh, code from the precursor, the superclass, just calculate the base amount, and then apply the premium rates. So we can say base is simply precursor. Precursor means call the uh, parent version that's inherited from the uh, student class. It's very similar to how, to how you use super in Java. Okay? And then we're going to apply this base to the premium rates. You can see that. Again, the things that are highlighted in yellows are the only ones that are newly declared in this subclass. Everything else was reused, inherited from the uh, superclass. Any questions about this? If you got, yes, go ahead. OK, good question. I would say it's a design choice. And the question was, it's a very good question. The question was, should the uh, student class over here be deferred? Okay, I will talk about deferred class maybe next time or maybe next week. So let me just show you. Uh, remember, I said before deferred in iPhone simply means abstract in Java. Okay, let me let me show you this. If I say deferred class students versus class students. Okay? Let's compare these two, these decorations. Apparently, that's the only difference, right? So now, remember back in your Java course, when we say if a class is abstract, that means you cannot create an instance out of it directly. It's a similar idea over here. So now, let's say in this case over here, in the client code, if you try to write something like creates, uh, let me just do it again. Let's say I got students over here of type students. It's a local variable, let's say. And then you say creates students s dot make and something here. So this will be disallowed. Why? Because you declare students to be deferred. That means you can never create an instance out of it. However, you can create instance of its subclasses. That's something we'll talk about. Okay? On the other hand, over here, because the student is just, just a normal class, so you can certainly do that. You can say student over here, and then you can say creates students s dot make. So this will be fine. It's a design, design choice. If you don't want to have any direct instances from students, make it deferred. If you want, make it not deferred. Okay. We'll talk more about deferred maybe a little bit later. Okay. But for now, for this, this example here, let's say it's not deferred. Okay. Got some question? Or that's answered? Just redefine. Yeah, maybe if you got, yeah, we can ask me later if you got more. Yeah, okay, very good. Okay, okay, let's say this. Oh, let me just go back here. Okay, we got here is redefine. Okay, what about non-resident students? In that case, very similar. Inherit from the same superclass, and then you can see that the only thing we change is discount rate, set discount rate, and discount rate here, right? Everything else is just inherited. So now you can see that we have a common place for storing all the common code for students, which is called students. For the resident students, we only introduce new things when necessary. Everything that's already defined, we just reuse it. We don't duplicate the definitions. Okay? So now, so that's the uh, hierarchy here, uh, just about the uh, terminology. So you are familiar with parents and super child and subclass. But we will use terms like ancestor and descendants on Wednesday to introduce you systematically into polymorphism and dynamic binding. We'll get there. Okay? So these are the terms you should get familiar with. Okay, so now how do we so that's the uh, first aspect for inheritance is for code reuse. 
When I get to the second one, that's actually more interesting. But to really understand the second one, make sure you understand what the first one is. I'm going to draw you some diagram to conclude this slide, and then we can hopefully move on to the second aspect. So inheritance in iPhone, not just in iPhone, in any OOP language, anyone. For inheritance, you define the common features, can be attributes, can be commands, can be queries in a separate class or separate classes. Okay? And then, for example, in this case, the student class. Now, every subclass of the student class is like a specialized version. When I say specialized, you're trying to introduce something a little bit more, or you can redefine the behavior of the parent class. Okay? Over here, for example, let's say in the, um, so you can see here the common attributes are over here, name and courses. And also, you also got the common command called register. They are common, they are completely shared. And also, some part of it is also common for tuition, right? To calculate the base amount. Okay, so now we really have el eliminated the code duplicates. And we can also define new behavior. That's why we say the subclasses are specialized version. It can be, you want to define set premium rates for resident students. This is only specific to that particular class. Or you can define set discount rate for non-resident students. Okay. okay, you can also redefine the behavior, either compound tuition or discounted tuition, right? Any question about this before I draw you some diagram? Yeah. Uh, you say inherits, yeah. Uh, say yeah. It has in, its own copy. It's very good question. I'll draw the diagram to you. Yeah. So the question was, when you inherit the attribute, what does that really mean? Do you actually have a reference to the attribute for your parent object, or you simply have a separate copy? Okay, I'll explain it to you in just a moment. Okay, let me now try to draw you some diagram over here. Let me, let me first of all, okay, and then you run the same, let me make a final point before I get to the diagram. So we run exactly the same test case that we ran for the first version without inheritance. So now you will see the same test actually pass. So what does that mean? We are not really changing the external behavior of the program. So we can still calculate tuition, we still got uh, discount rate, premium rates, but somehow the design has been refactored, has been improved. Okay? That's something I want to stress, emphasize. So now with inheritance, it's much easier to actually maintain. Let's say this, with this new design over here, if I want to change the registration policy, which means I want to change the register method, how many classes do I need to modify? In this case, just one, right? Just go to the student class, modify that, and then the modified version will be inherited to both subclasses automatically, okay? Okay, so now before I talk about this, let me first of all show you some, uh, I will talk about this in just a moment but I want to just show you a diagram, okay, over here. And I also draw something uh, on the iPad. So this is the inheritance hierarchy we have. We got students, resident student, and non-resident student. In the student class, we got two attributes, name and courses. So these are the two attributes we have. In the resident student, we got an extra attribute there called premium rates. For non-resident student, we got something called discount rate. So how does the, the thing work out at the runtime? Let me just show you some example here. Okay, let's have a new page, and then I'll show it to you. Okay, let's say this. Let's say we have S over here, students. RS, resident students. NRS, non-resident students. Let's say we have these three variables, okay? I'm going to talk about something called static type versus dynamic type in just a moment. For now, let's not worry about it just yet, okay? That'll be the next topic. Now, how do we create objects? You can say creates students over here s dot make. And you're going to pass some name. I'll just say, uh, what about just s over here? And then I'm going to say Creates, oh, let me just draw the diagram right away. So what does that mean? That means I'm creating a new reference variable called s over there. And s is pointing to some new objects on the memory of type students. Okay, you can see that's student type. Now the question is, what attributes do we have? 
for students. Because S was declared as students, it only contains the attributes that are declared in the students, in which case it's only name and courses, right? Only name and courses. In this case, it would just be S and then some empty uh, list of courses, right? That's what S. Now, what about another one? I'll use a different color. Let's say creates resident students over here, rs dot make. Over here, I'm going to say rs. Okay. Now the diagram is going to look a little bit differently. Okay. Now you can see that rs was declared of type rs. It's called a static type. Whatever type you declare at the compile time is called a static type. Now, how does the diagram kind of look like? So rs over here is a new variable we are introducing. So rs is pointing to some objects over here of type resident students. Now, how many attributes do we have? First of all, we should have name and courses for sure because they got inherited from the superclass. And we also get, remember, the new attributes called premium weights from the resident students, right? So we got three. So now we got three attributes over here, name, courses, and premium rates. So you can think about somehow the inheritance hierarchy that we define in the compile time. It got flattened out as the object structure at the runtime. Okay? So you can see that over here, you can see, I just highlight, so these two are inherited from inherited from students. And this one is newly declared in the resident student class. Is it clear? Just about how you draw the diagram at the runtime. Okay, similarly, if I just do another one, let's say creates nrs, nrs dot make. And then you got nrs. How many attributes are you going to have? Two or three, or four. Any idea? Three. Okay. Three. Which three? From the non-resident student, not premium rate, right? Should be a discount rate. Okay. So now for this one here, NRS is a variable that is going to point to some object over here, but now the object is a different type, NRS. Now, because they have the same superclass, so it's going to be name and courses. I'll say CS for courses. And then in this case, we're talking about different class, non-resident students. They should have discount rate. So that should be DR. You can see this part here. Again, this part is really the same. But the only, that what really distinguishes between the two objects here is the uh, discount rate. Okay? It's really important to understand the object structure over here, because when we talk about the rationale behind polymorphism and polymorphic assignments, these are how we prove that certain rules actually work or not. Okay? It's really important. Okay? Any question about this before I move on? Okay? I don't necessarily ask you to actually draw diagrams in the test or final exam. It's too difficult to grade, to be honest. But I might give you some fragment of code or design, and I will ask you to justify why something will compile, but something will not. Of course, we'll do lots of exercises in class. Okay? That's something I would like you to learn. That's more about uh, understanding the design rationale. We'll get there. OK, let's do a little warm up. How about that? Before I do the warm up, let me clarify some terminology here. OK? Static type versus dynamic type. Today is just about syntax. I will talk more about what static type and dynamic type uh, really mean in, on Wednesday. Today, just about syntax, more, more about syntax. And I'll compare uh, between Java and iPhone. The ideas are completely consistent. It's only about syntax. Okay? First of all, you should know that static type versus dynamic type is really a phenomenon for object orientation. For any language that you learn about that's object oriented, they should support this idea, not just about iPhone. Okay? So there are two kinds of types for every entity at a runtime. Okay? 
Well, I shouldn't say runtime. There are two types of MTT. One at the compile time, the other one at the runtime. Two kinds of types. The first one is called static type. Static type is whatever that you declare on your programming text. Okay? You say, for example, s colon students. You're declaring s of type students. And this is really important to realize the static type is unchangeable. Once you declare that, you can never change it. Never, ever. Okay? On the other hand, and also, this is also one thing I would like you to remember. That's the only thing you got to remember. What's so important about static type is the static type of a, uh, a variable tells you what kind of features that you can call on that particular variable. But we'll see that. Okay, I'll give you examples. And we also got dynamic type. Dynamic type is changeable at the runtime. You can change the dynamic type to one thing to another for as often as you like. Okay, let's just see what, what happens in Java. If I have the following line, do you see what is the what the static type is, what the dynamic type is? Student is a static type, right? And the students over there, oh, and the student on the right hand side in red is that, that the dynamic type. In this case, it happens to be that the two types are the same. Just happens to be the same. This one is more interesting. This one is also allowed. I will explain why such assignment is allowed okay, in, in a bit. Now, again, the green one is where you declare some variable. In this one, that's also static type. And the right-hand side, it's, it's a dynamic type. You can see the green and the red are different. They can be different. However, it, it, they cannot be arbitrary. So you, they have to follow certain rules, which I will talk about systematically on Wednesday. Okay? That's something you should know. What about IFO? IFO, the same idea, but the syntax is different. Okay, let's see that. So now IFO, first of all, when you declare a variable, you're gonna say, for example, s colon students are s colon students. That's how you declare the static type. How do you do the dynamic type? It's when you do the creates over here. So when you say, for example, creates s of type students that make Allen. In this case, we are saying that s has been declared of static type students. And now we are assigning some dynamic type called student to it. That's why you see the green and red. You know, I did that intentionally. And also RS, that was declared as a student type statically. And now we're trying to, at the runtime, assign that to resident students. Okay. One more thing that might be, I would say that's convenient, but can be confusing as well. Now in IFO, if the static type and the dynamic type are meant to be the same, if you intend to do that, you can ignore that bracket part. For example, you can say something like this. So if I declare s of type students over here, I say create s.main. You don't see I've got a bracket part, right? So it's as if I said the following, create students s.make, Alan. It's as if. Okay? Just some syntax where you get used to. But nothing new here. So what you can do in Java, you can also do in IFO, and vice versa. Guys, any question about this syntax here before I move on? Okay, and then we have some, hopefully, a little bit interaction. Okay, hopefully. Okay, static type and dynamic type are really important when you talk about object orientation. Now, let's say we have the following setup. We have S1, S2, S3. So we have three uh, objects for students. That's why I call it S1, S2, S3. We also got another variable called RS of static type resident students. Another variable called NRS whose static type is non-resident students. Okay? So these are the static types. That's a setup. Let's say we do the following. First of all, we say that S1.make and the dynamic type is students, right? And now we got S2.make and resident students. We got S3 here, non-resident students. So these are all valid up to now, all valid. For RS, I can say resident students. For NRS, I got non-resident students. Okay, you can see again, green means static, red means dynamic. Okay, now here's the question. Here's the question. I'm gonna do this exhaustively in the following sense. Remember in the, uh, all the three classes we talk about, we have, a, we have the attributes called name, courses, and also we got the method called, uh, the feature called register. 
and the query called tuition, right? So we got these defined. And also we got an attribute called premium rates, an attribute uh, command called set premium rates, discount rate, and set discount rate. So these are all the features that we have talked about so far. Now I want to ask you about, if I try to do a dot notation, for example, s dot something, or nrs dot something, would that compile or not? Let's just get your intuition first, and then I will tell you why it is the case. Why don't we just do some guess, or just maybe you know that already. So first of all, let's say for S1. If I say, for example, let me just do one by one. If I say S1.name, is it going to compile? S1.courses? S1.register? Yes, because register is defined in student, right? S1.tuition? Yes? However, that would call the base amount rate, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, now S1.PR. S1.PR? The answer is no. Okay, I wouldn't say why for now. I just, just, you know, just go over. I, can, I will simply tell you if that's right or wrong. Okay? S1.PR will not compile. S1.setPR? No? Good. S1.DR, S1.setDR? Also no. Very good. Now, let's get more interesting comparison here. Let's now talk about S2. I want to either confuse you or give you hints. Since you can see S2 was defined as students, right? Static type. However, S2 is now pointing to a resident students. Intuitively, you should be able to call it premium rate, intuitively, right? Let's see that. Now, let's do the list again. S2.name, yes, good. S2.courses, S2.register, yes. S2.tuition, good. S2.pr. I heard yes, because of my hints, right? As I told you, I, would, I meant to confuse you. No. S2.pr, no. No. S2.setpr, <laughs> no, cannot be yes, right? There wouldn't, there's no way, okay? S2.pr, no. S2.setpr, no. S2.dr, no. S2.setdr, no. Okay? Well, you know, I, I don't want to tell you just yet. You know, let's just see how interesting it is. Of course, if I give you a test, I wouldn't give you the same classes. I might just give you a symbolic name, A, B, and C. Okay? I'll give you some practice, don't worry. Okay. Now, let's talk about S3. Again, my hints for you, S3. You can see S3 over here, it was declared as a student, but now it's now pointing to non-resident students. So it should be able to get to the uh, discount rate. Don't you agree? It should be able to. Okay, now, S3.name, yes. S3.courses, yes. S3.register, yes. S3.tuition, good. S3.pr, that one knows obvious because it's resident student, the other class. S3.setpr, no. S3.dr, no or yes. Okay, to be consistent with the previous, right, right? Just no. Very good. You guys are logical, I like that. Okay, no, also no. Okay, so now let's see, up to now, let's draw a mini conclusion. It says that the red types over there do not matter. Dynamic type doesn't matter. The only type that does matter is the green one, which is static. For those of you who are now taking 2001, this is related. I'll briefly mention, I'll let Jeff elaborate that later. Okay? So there is something in computer science called undecidability, which means there are certain problems simply the computer cannot solve. This is one example. Okay? What the computer can do, like a, your Eclipse compiler, what they can do is they can keep track of the static types, the green ones. That's where you define the variables, right? However, for the, for the red ones over there, you can change them in a much more sophisticated way. You can either say, if something, I'll change dynamic type to this. If something else, I'll change that to something else, the dynamic type. So in, in general, the way you change the, uh, the dynamic type can be arbitrarily complicated. So it's simply untrackable. Okay, so now if I give you a project for this course, I say now the project is as follows. If you get it, you get 100% A plus for this course. Here's the project. You can try. 
given a, oh, let me write it down for you. If you can do it, not only that you get A+, plus, you can also graduate from CS with summa cum laude. So I'm really saying that, okay, it's, uh, the living is not doable. But I want to draw you some uh, attention here. So again, everything in, oh, thank you, yeah. Everything in CS is somehow related. Let's say this is the project if you want to try, again, okay. Now, this is your program. Okay, now, there are several inputs over here. So for example, I'd say that a variable name, and then, let's say you Java, since you like Java. A Java program. And the output is going to be as follows. The last dynamic type of the input variable. I'll give you one example. Let's say this is your program over here. I simply put, let's say, RS over here, right? And then you can be whatever program I give to you, some program, some program.java. And then you, your output might be the last dynamic type for this particular variable is, let's say, resident students. Let's say in the previous case, it is, because you can see for, let's say this is our program, that's it. So RS over here, the last dynamic type for that is simply resident students. So that one should be the output. But now, the, the problem I give to you is any arbitrary program. I want to get the last dynamic type. If you can do this one here, that's more than an A plus for 3311. So the, in fact, you just cannot do it. Seriously, theoretically impossible. It's something called undecidability problem. It's simply undecidable for dynamic type, okay? I'll tell you why I can easily give you a program that can trick your program, okay? For example, this program here, this just aside, you know, just for your knowledge, right? I'm not sure if Jeff will talk about it, but I would, I would like to draw this link anyway. Let's say this is the program I give to you. I say that while Okay, let, let, me, let me put a while a little bit later. Let's say RS, RS is new RS. That is program here, right? I will simply say while true. So what does this program do? It assigns a dynamic type of to RS, which is RS, and then it goes infinitely without even terminating. So there's no last, data, uh, there's no last dynamic type for this program. Okay, anyway, so uh, don't try to do this, that's my point. Yeah. Okay, guys, anyway, so now, up to now, our conclusion is, our observation is, to define, to determine if a particular feature or method call works or not, or compiles or not, we only look at the static type. The red types, which is dynamic, does not matter, okay? When, let me make it even more elaborate to you. When we declare S1, S2, and S3 to be students over here for the green one, so that means you can only call the features that are defined in the students, which is names, courses, register, and tuition. That's it. Doesn't matter what the dynamic type is. Doesn't matter. Okay, now just one more exercise over here, and then we'll get to the intuition. Okay? So now, what about, oh, I already give you, right? What about RS? <laughs> so now, given this, if I got RS, you can see RS, the static type is resident students. Now in this case, what can we do and what can we not do? There are only two things you cannot do, right? Which are the two? PR and, oh, DR, DR, right? Yeah, discount rate, right? That's the only thing you cannot do. Very good, you can get that idea. Exactly, like that? Okay, like that. Okay, any questions about this exercise here? Yes. I see. So it's a good question here. So basically what you're asking is, let me just, uh, just share that with the rest of the class. 
Let me make it a little bit more general. Let's say this is what I have. Students, um, actually, I should write in Eiffel, right? Students over here, OK? That's the static type, OK? Your question was, if somewhere down in the middle, I want to call something like, I want to know if they are either resident or non-resident students. If I try this, well, apparently in our design so far, the only way to tell if they are resident students is to see if they got premium rates, right? So if you simply just do s dot premium rates, again, this will not compile. No way, because s was declared as student, and student does not have premium rate. Okay, first of all, that's the issue. If you really want to do that, you can do something called cast. That's something we'll get into a little bit later. Mm -hmm. But if you really think, I'll tell you what, a better design would be as follows. If you really think making such decision is really important between the two kinds of students, you should make that feature available in the student class. Okay? Yeah. Okay, let's now do some intuition together. But if you download the source code for uh, the inheritance.zip, you will see that I got all the lines of code over there for you. Okay, you can just uncomment those and try to play with them. It's really important to get this right. Yes. Oh, oh, I mean, okay, yeah, yeah, this one is only a sketch of the idea, yeah. But in, in bond diagram, it wouldn't be so much different. Of course, you'll be oval circle, and also the arrow will be a little bit different, yeah. But I just want to show you the idea first, okay, yeah. Okay, good. So now, let's go to the next one. So now, I want to first talk about polymorphism. I want to give you intuition today, and then I will talk about systematic rules on Wednesday, okay, for polymorphism. Now, again, let's take a guess. Okay, take a guess. Let's say we got S and RS. So now the uh, green and red, they don't mean static and dynamic anymore, okay? I simply mean S is a variable in green, RS is just another variable in red. They're just different variables. Students and resident students. Now, I say create S make Stella, and also RS make Rachel. One start with S, the other one start with R. That's why I chose the name. Now I say RS does set premium rates 1.25 because Rachel was a resident student, right? So I can say set premium rates. So far, so good. Now, I want you to consider two assignments here. I say S is assigned to RS versus RS is assigned to S. Do they both work or do they both not work? or you have no clue? Huh? Neither. neither will work, which means both not work. Okay, any idea, guys? You know, I, I give you some hints based on what you learned from 2030. I'm not, ta I'm not teaching anything that's inconsistent here. Yeah. Line nine will work, positive? You mean line nine is negative? And line eight is positive. All right, guys, are you sure? You know what? Democracy might work in this case. You want to vote? Before I tell you the truth, democracy might work. Guys, how about we do a vote, please? Okay, if either line number eight works or line number nine works, uh, let me just vote first before I talk here, okay? Line number eight? Oh, okay, okay, again. Does, okay, uh, eight or nine, which one works? Positive. Okay, now, line number eight works. Raise your hand. Okay, line number nine works. Raise your hand. Oh, seems to be more. I'm happy. I'm very happy because that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, so far, whenever I teach a, uh, this topic here, uh, I really got the majority getting the right answer, which is good. That's why we're going to learn, right? Maybe that's your intuition, okay? So hopefully today will change your intuition. The answer is line number eight does, sorry, line number eight works, positive. Line number nine does not work, negative. Now I'm going to show you why, okay? You got a reasoning, almost like a proof, uh, 
user-friendly proof, okay, in the slides. But now I want to move on to iPad and show it to you, okay? It's really important to get, uh, get right, okay? Okay, let's sketch this idea over here. I just want to get to the slides so I can uh, refer to it. And then we'll talk about this before the end of the class. Yeah, we got some time. Don't worry, we got time. Okay, now I'm gonna present basically the proof to you, but I'm trying to uh, present it more smoothly, okay? Okay, let's try to do a new page over here. Oh, sorry, not here. Add page below. Okay, so now this is what we have. Let me just rec recreate them very quickly. We got S, students. We got RS, resident students. Okay, that's the decoration. And then, let's say we have, let's not worry about the creates. So these are just creation. They are not important. So now, we, and then we say RS dot set premium rates, and then 1.25, okay? And then we have S is assigned to RS versus RS is assigned to S. What I said was, this one is okay, but this one is wrong. Okay, that's what I said. So now let's see that. Let me draw some diagram for you, first of all. So now we have S is pointing to some student objects. And we got RS that is pointing to some resident students objects resident student objects. Now, remember I said to you before, the visualization is really important, okay? So now, for students, how many attributes do we have? We got name and courses, right? Good, very good. And uh, in this case, it doesn't matter what the value is, that's not the point. And now, how many attributes do we have for our, uh, RS? Three, right? At least it's not two, okay? Very good. Now. To understand this precisely, you have to know why. We draw the diagram like this, courses and premium rates. I'm gonna highlight this just because it's extra. Okay, now let's prove by contradiction, which means I'm going to prove that to you that the pink one there, why it is wrong. To prove that something is wrong, why don't we assume it is okay? We assume it is okay, and then I'm gonna show you we can crash our computer, okay? How do we do that? Now, let's say we assume this is okay for now. Assume this is okay for now, first step. Now, remember what we said when we did exercises over there? We said that the features that you can call on a particular variable only depends on the static type. Now. What features can we call on RS? What features can call on RS? For example, we can say, can we say RS.name? Yes, right? Can we say RS.premium rates? Very good, thank you. I'll highlight that. Okay, that's the second step. We assume that it's okay, and now we do that. So now, step number three. One, two, and three. Now number three, let's do this assignment over here. What does that mean? That means RS is now going to point to S. Agree? RS is going to store the address of the object that is pointed by S. So this means RS is assigned to S. Sorry, that's a calling equal. So now, can you see what the problem is? So you, mm -hmm. you see, the static type of RS is simply RS, which tells us we can expect to call RS.PR. But if we allow that pink assignment to occur, that means RS might point to a student object, which has no way contain the uh, PR attributes. In this case, calling rs.pr is going to crash. You're, you're looking for pr, but there's certainly no such field at the runtime, okay? So now, 
after this, we can say that number four. R is pointing to students with no PR. You can see over here, you only got name and courses. There's no PR. So rs.pr crash. That's how I prove my contradiction. If we allow that pink assignment there in the first place, we end up being crashed. Guys, any question about this? Okay, how about I take questions and then we are done. Okay, let's take questions. Yeah. I would suggest before Wednesday, apply the same logic to see if things might just work out before you see the slides. Yes, question, yeah. Uh -huh. You said set VR to 2025, and then once you assign RS to S. Yeah, in that case, you can see the object there, RS object is no longer being pointed to. We, we simply said hypothetically, let's assume if the assignment was allowed, and this is what's going to happen. But allowing the assignment, the pink one, will actually lead you to crash. That's why it was not, yeah, that's why it was forbidden. But the green one? The green one will be okay. That's an exercise for you. By Wednesday, apply the same logic, and the green one will just work okay. Okay, guys, look, uh, study the slides, and then we'll continue on Wednesday, okay?